Hi everyone. So this is our final lecture for philosophy of science um, and today we're going to talk about the meaning of life. Um, I'm sad to say I don't actually know what the meaning of life is. I don't know what the meaning of life is. Um, but I think it's worth talking about, especially in the context of philosophy of science, because the question of what, if anything, makes our lives meaningful is one of those absolutely central classic philosophical questions. Uh, and it's one that I think, well, one of the arguments that I'm going to try to make for you today, it's one of those questions that have been radically transformed by the rise of the kind of scientific worldview. So the ways that we can think about this question now have really shifted from where they were, say, a thousand years ago or 2000 or 3000 years ago. Uh, that is assuming that you're kind of on board with the broad scientific worldview. Um, I think that it's uh, science has made some answers to this question look less plausible. And some people worry, some people are convinced, in fact, that science has shown us that there is no answer to this question, that science shows that life has no meaning. Um, that's a viewpoint that I would like to resist. Uh, I've been raised my whole life in a, in a broadly scientific worldview, and I nonetheless have at least a sense, a felt sense, of the meaningfulness or the, the significance of at least some of my actions. Uh, and I hope I hope you do too. So uh, what would be nice is if that sense, that sort of experiential feeling of significance had some uh, correlate in the real world. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is the question of, you know, is that plausible? Can we say that our sense of having uh, our actions having meaning, having significance, be maintained even if you're fully on board with the scientific worldview. So that's our topic. Okay, so to start, let's make some simple clarifications. So uh, let's distinguish meaning in the semantic sense from meaning in the sense of purpose, goal, significance, value, or something like that. So uh, I know an extremely smart but somewhat antisocial philosopher who uh, says when she gets on airplanes and other such things, people often ask, what do you do? She says, philosopher, and they immediately come back with, what's the meaning of life? Um, and she in invariably replies that meaning is the sort of things that words and sentences have, and life is not a word or sentence, therefore life doesn't have meaning. Um, this is apparently, she reports, a very effective way to get people to stop talking to her. <clears throat> but it's probably not exactly what we were hoping for in terms of an answer, right? So uh, what what we want when we ask, you know, does life have a meaning, is not to know whether it has the meaning in the sense of uh, sort of semantic value. It doesn't uh, mean something in the, in the same way that a word or a sentence means something. It means something in the way that like something can have value or significance or purpose, right? Those are the, those are the senses of meaning that we're hoping to get out of this. So uh, when we're asking about the meaning of life, we're leaving aside one sense of meaning, we're focused on another. Okay, so start with purpose, goal, significance, that kind of thing. And then we'll ask, can, hum can we understand a way in which human life might have one of those things? So, uh, Partly this is why leading why the last lecture was about function and purpose in nature, because I was hoping to sort of lead into this stuff uh, to talk not in this context of the meaning of life, but just in the context of philosophy of biology more generally. So when we're thinking about the purpose of something, uh, when we're thinking about the sort of value or significance or the goal of a thing, um, it's pretty clear that things that we make have purposes, right? A hammer is for hammering. I don't know anybody who would disagree with that. Um, and last time we talked about the possibility of um, biological functions or biological purposes. So my heart is for pumping blood. That in some, I mean, there's probably some reasonable sense that you can make of that sentence, right? Like it, my heart is for pumping blood. Maybe you wanna have, present a reductionist account of that. But nonetheless, it's a true and meaningful sentence to say that the function or the purpose of my lungs is to exchange air with the atmosphere or something like that. So 
certainly some things have purposes. We can we can confidently say that, I would propose. Artifacts are things that we make clearly have purposes. Um, and more debatably, but still plausibly, uh, the parts of biological things or our organs have purposes. And then the question is, do we? I mean, I don't, I mean, it's not super comforting to me if my heart has a purpose and my liver has a purpose but if i don't as a whole i identify with the collection of all my parts if i don't have a purpose that's not very much comfort so the question for me is you know do i as a whole have a purpose um, or can i be assigned one or something like that uh so This is, this is one question on which the evolving scientific uh, sort of picture of the world has made a big difference in what sounds plausible, what seems plausible. Um, for Aristotle, as we've, as we've said uh, a number of times in this class, I think, uh, nature was full of purposes. Uh, everything in the universe had a proper place in the Aristotelian picture of the universe. Um, and so, I mean, here's a, barely see it, but here's a, here's a picture of the Aristotelian cosmology with earth in the center and then air above that and then fire above that. Everything tries to return to its proper place in the universe and the proper place of everything. So that's why rocks fall down because that's where they're supposed to be in the universe. Um, and everything's proper place is defined by its essence. The essence of a rock is the earthiness that it, that composes it, and its essence determines what its proper place in the universe is. So, I don't know about you, but I actually feel a kind of a sense of loss when I think about this kind of picture. Um, I'm I'm jealous of people who got to live like this that they got to believe wholeheartedly and according to the best scientific picture of the world available to them that not just rocks and fire and air but people too had an essence something that was essential to us that is to say they had a, a kind of uh, definite nature or character that determined objectively and clearly what our po proper place in the universe is a metaphorically place here so it's not just where you're supposed to be but how you're supposed to behave so for aristotle uh the essence of a human is threefold we have a vegetative essence uh, an animal essence and the rational essence and the rational essence is the one most characteristic of humans so all plants and animals have vegetation and metabolism animals have the ability to move around humans have the ability to think and for aristotle the best way to live the best human life is to just fulfill your rational essence to become a thinker to learn math and philosophy to reflect to do science and that was kind of on his on his picture of the world that was just built into us and it's just there's just a fact of the matter about what the best kind of life is to live. That fact of the matter is determined by our essence. Um, that sounds really nice. I mean, I, I wish I could. I wish I could believe that. I wish I could uh, go back to the Aristotelian worldview where there's just there's just really clear answers about what kind of life you should be living. And those answers are determined by our essences. Uh, you know, similarly, uh, for people who, and there's many people today who uh, live with a religious worldview, where there's a creator God, and that God created us for some reason. We not, might not be completely clear on what that reason is. Uh, so for many for many religious traditions, the, the, the divine plan is ineffable that is to say we can't understand it uh, because God is too uh, complex for us to wrap our tiny brains around but there's this comforting thought that there is some plan um, that is that there is some purpose 
in mind for each and every one of us that's determined by a divine creator. And that also sounds really nice to me. It sounds really, uh, you could really like take a bath in that and feel very comfortable um, knowing that someone or something had a specific plan in mind for you and your life. I'm, je I'm jealous of people who believe that because uh, it, it sounds very nice uh, and that all you have to do basically is just sort of follow the rules of your religion to the best of your ability and be the best person you can according to the moral system that it dictates and you're doing the thing that you're here to do. Um, so despite my jealousy, it's not clear to me that I can believe that. So I was raised without a religious tradition. I wasn't raised in any particular religion. Um, and despite, despite actually trying at various points in my life to get into one of these ways of seeing the world, I've just been unsuccessful. And I think I'm not unique in this. I think a lot of people find it very hard to accept this kind of picture of the world um, for a variety of reasons. But one of the contributors is undoubtedly the, the sort of shift in our picture of the overall universe. And this is the point at which science seems to have made a substantial impact on the ways that we're, it's possible for us to think about the meaning or significance of our own lives. Um, so one of these, <clears throat> one thing that sort of has made an influence here is the emergence of evolutionary theory. So uh, if you have no theory of evolution, it's very hard to explain how we got here at all. Um, and that means that probably something put us here on purpose, therefore there's a divine creator. Um, but given the theory of evolution, that, that story is less plausible, I would say. Uh, or it's less necessary. Sorry, let me, let, me, let me walk that back. It's not that you can't believe that we're divinely created. Um, the current line of the Catholic Church is evolution is true and... God determined how evolution would go. So uh, the Catholic Church is perfectly happy to combine religious belief and uh, evolutionary theory. There's lots of room in evolutionary theory for divine intervention. So there's uh, supposedly random mutations that uh, dr drive the variation that natural selection acts on. Uh, there's the, the setup of the environment. Uh, and both of those things are things that a divine creator could have arranged carefully to bring about certain results and it would still very much look like evolution by natural selection acting on random mutations. So there's no strict incompatibility between the theory of evolution and religious belief. Um, and I think uh, both religious thinkers and philosophers of biology agree on that, on that point. Um, but at the same time, if the argument for a divine creator was, I can't think of any other way we might have gotten here, then that argument is undermined by the existence of the theory of evolution because it is an alter it is an alternative story where a blind create uh, like you don't need an intelligent designer to end up with us. So, um, so some people try to kind of roll with this and say that evolution gives us our purpose. So. Uh, you might say, well, uh, evolution tells us what our proper purpose is, which is essentially to survive and reproduce. Um, so what are, what are we really? So in some sense, the belief here is that evolution gives us an essence in the same way that Aristotle thought we had essences. E evolution tells us really what kind of beings we are. And in the same way that Aristotle thought you could just extrapolate from essences to the purpose and to the proper place in the universe, we can do the same thing with evolution. So we're, what are we really? We're evolved beings. Um, and that tells us, you know, our essence. And then you can use that essence to derive how we should live. Um, but I don't think that really works. If you, especially if you think through the kind of details of the story, I mean, on 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 the for the the first thing is just mere survival and reproduction doesn't seem to be a very intuitively speaking a very meaningful uh sort of activity uh 
if if an individual human life is itself meaningless, I don't see any reason why a whole series of human lives would thereby acquire meaning. Um, it's if you just repeating a meaningless thing doesn't seem to, at least automatically, imbue it with significance and meaning. Uh, and we know that um, if, if what we're hoping for, so I started this by talking about a kind of felt sense of meaning. Like I hope, I've hope you hope you've had at least some of this experience in your life where you're like, wow, this feels really important. This feels really significant. This feels worth doing. So we have this felt sense of the meaningfulness of some of our activities, at least some of the time. Um, and we might hope that that has that felt sense track something in reality. But when people are reduced to mere survival, they often lose that sense. I mean, uh, especially if the if the sort of challenge of survival is taken away from somebody. So you can imagine somebody who's locked in prison and somebody says to them, okay, we're going to feed you, uh, we're going to take care of you medically, and we're going to uh, take some of your uh, gametes, either your eggs or your sperm, and implant them in somebody else you'll never you'll never see the other person you'll never meet your children but you will reproduce um i it's hard for me to imagine that person having much of a felt sense of meaning in their lives that sounds like a horrible existence to me although it fully satisfies the uh the apparent evolutionary purpose of survival and reproduction uh so that doesn't seem super satisfying to me as an answer to what our what our purpose here is right uh furthermore i mean uh this this story only kind of works for guys but if guys or not just guys but like people people who do whoever produces sperm uh if you're a if you're a sperm producer and you believe this then here's what the most meaningful life you could possibly live would be work just enough to travel around to as many sperm banks as you can and deposit as much sperm as you can in as many sperm banks and lie to them about what kind of life you have. Tell them you went to Harvard, you were in the Olympics, you've never had a health problem because that's what increases your, that's the, the most reproductive opportunities that you could possibly get. Um, and that sounds not like a meaningful life to me. Again, there, there, there just seems like this radical disconnect between that sort of activity and the felt sense of meaning that you get from a whole bunch of activities that have frankly nothing to do with survival and reproduction. So I really don't think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to entertain counter arguments if you, if you do hold this view, but I really don't think that you can simply um, adopt a kind of quasi Aristotelian essence determines purpose sort of view and just plug in evolution as what gives us our essence right evolution doesn't really tell us how we should it tells us how we got here but it doesn't really tell us what we should be doing once we're here that's my that's my proposal here okay so and then the other thing so that was we're talking about ways in which maybe the development of science has shifted the possibilities for thinking about our own lives as meaningful. So evolutionary theory was one of them. Here's another one. Here's a different way in which um, science, the advancements of science has shifted the ways we can think about our sub significance in the universe. Um, and this is from the reading from this week, or I guess last week, what is time, um, from uh, Guy Kahane. 2014, our cosmic insignificance. He's not actually going to argue that we're cosmically insignificant. In fact, he's going to argue the opposite. But he does sort of bring up this really interesting issue, this sort of historical issue of what happened since Copernicus, essentially. So as we discussed, uh, when we talked a little bit about Galileo, before Copernicus, the widespread view was that the earth was the center of the universe not just our solar system and this is this is important here it wasn't just that we thought the earth was the center of our solar system people generally speaking thought the earth was the center of the entire universe um, 
and that the universe was in fact much much smaller than it turns out to be so the fixed stars were not that far away um, and Copernicus's discovery that in fact we're not the center of our solar system and subsequent discoveries that ours is not the only solar system our nearby collection of solar systems is not the only galaxy that there is so and so on and so on so um, ever since Copernicus we've had this constantly unfolding uh, expansion of our, our view of how really really big the universe actually is uh, it's vast beyond imagining so we went from having a picture of ourselves at the very center of everything right for Aristotle we were at the center of everything now the center in Aristotle's picture wasn't that nice of a place actually so if we go back briefly to his picture of the universe I mean you, you can see that it's all sort of concentric circles and in the upper circles the furthest away from us um, you get to the fifth element uh, quintessence which is sort of perfect so it's unchanging it's immutable it's um, it's uh, uh, sort of like distilled perfection of matter and down on the earth all the elements are kind of confused and mixed up uh, mathematics doesn't really apply that well so mathematics applies really well to the stars because they are perfect they all move in perfect circles which is of course the most perfect shape according to Aristotle um, so the heavens were perfect the earth is kind of crummy we're, we're, we're in some sense at the bottom of the we're at the bottom of the well here right this is the worst place in the universe because it's the least perfect but it it's it's still the center right it's still a place of enormous significance because it's the center of everything and what we found out by basically looking through telescopes and doing some math was that we're not at the center of anything we're not at the center of our solar system we're not at the center of our galaxy we're not at our galaxy it seems to be normal amongst all of the galaxies so our our centrality in the universe was overthrown it no longer reasonable to believe that the universe was constructed around us because our sun is pretty normal there's nothing especially odd about it our solar system is pretty normal our galaxies has nothing especially interesting about it so um, this displacement from the center of things and you can see a similar displacement with the theory of evolution so uh, when we we saw ourselves for a really long time as a kind of central species right we are the special ones because we are the ones created in God's image you might say and then when the theory of evolution gets developed we go through a similar revolution in our picture of things so we are a weird species we're a species with massively overdeveloped brains and a, a very complex social and cultural system but we're not in any metaphysical sense special we're just the ones that happen to figure out tools before anybody else and develop these big honking brains and wreck the place right so um there's a kind of Copernican we call this the Copernican shift where um, you know our apparent centrality in the universe gets disrupted so there's another kind of shift that happens so science displaces us from being uh, in some sense God's special creations and also displaces us from being apparently the center of the universe so if you're hoping to have a sense of if you're hoping to sort of do a strictly scientific worldview and uh, find a sense of meaning you better not bank on us being the special center of everything so. okay so I'm gonna go into uh, Kahani's paper a little bit now so this is the this is the, the distinctions and the ideas he develops in this paper our cosmic significance so he wants to distinguish I think it's helpful to distinguish significance and value so Kahani makes this argument that we should keep these two ideas separate in our heads so a nickel has value its value is very well defined it's worth five Canadian cents um, and that might be important to you so depending on you know if you're five cents short of getting a coffee that you really want that's that's really 
it's important value, right? The value of the thing is definite. Does it have significance? Um, well, that depends on how your life is going. So uh, if you're if you're well off, you might see a nickel on the sidewalk and not even bend over to pick it up. Or it could make the difference between getting some food or not getting that food. So its significance depends quite a bit on the context, right? Uh, how many other nickels are available to you? What can a nickel buy you? Um, but its value is in some sense fixed, right? It's so for sure it's got a nickel sh for sure has value, but whether it has significance depends quite a bit on what else is going on. So, um, and furthermore, we should distinguish between two types of value. And so Kahani's paper is about our cosmic significance, uh, but I'm gonna come back to talk more about value um, for most of the rest of this lecture. Uh, so we should distinguish intrinsic from extrinsic value. So a thing has extrinsic value if it's good for getting something else. So for example, many people go through their university degrees because of mainly the extrinsic value of the thing. So you get a degree so that you can get a job. It's not that for you the degree matters all that much. If you could have gotten a good job without the degree, you would have just got got the job or something like that. Um, you know, that's a it's a tricky example because hopefully your university education also has some intrinsic value. That is, it's worth doing kind of for its own sake. Um, some things only have extrinsic value, so I wouldn't. I mean, I, if 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 money wasn't good for exchanging for goods and services, I wouldn't care about money at all, I don't think. I mean, it's numbers on a screen mostly, or it's little pieces of plastic. Like I have no I have no intrinsic love of the physical materiality of money. I like having money because it gets me other stuff that I want. So money seems to be on the extreme end of extrinsic value. Whereas uh, some things seem to have only intrinsic value. So I'm not doing it for the sake of anything else, I'm just doing it for the sake of itself. So I hope for that. Hopefully, that distinction is at least somewhat clear. Um, the question then is, what might be intrinsically valuable? So here's just a couple of things that people often talk about as being intrinsically valuable: um, happiness. So I think it's very plausible. Although I'm going to question this in a little bit, I think it's very plausible to say like. If somebody says, well, why do you want to be happy? You say, well, not for any reason. It's just to be happy. That's, that's, I just want to be happy, the end. Why do you want to experience joy or pleasure? Uh, or why do you want to be alive? Maybe life itself is intrinsically valuable. Why, why do we want to preserve life on earth, for example? So uh, maybe we want to make sure that we don't cause an extinction event that wipes out all life on earth even if it means humans have to go away so we don't get to we don't get to enjoy it at all but we might say no life itself is intrinsically valuable it's worth something it's 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 got value not for the sake of anything else but just for its own sake okay so lots of debate about what might be or not be intrinsically valuable you might have your own thoughts um, but this is the kind of thing that often gets sort of tossed out as things that might be worthwhile just in, in and of themselves. And if we're looking at the value of life itself, um, you know, you'd better hope that there's something that is intrinsically valuable, right? You, to, if you're getting a thing to get a thing to get a thing to get a thing, um, you kind of want for there to be something at the end of the chain, right? You want something to ground the value of a whole bunch of things that are extrinsically valuable. You want something to ground that chain, right? So I went to university so that I could get a job, so that I could make money, so that I could get a house, so that I could raise a family, so that I could something, right? Enjoy it or, uh, or uh, you know, cultivate, cultivate a life or something, something that's worth it just for its own sake, right? So you want, you I would suggest that we want something 
uh, to have intrinsic value. Um, okay, so just really quick, I want to do a, a fun thought experiment uh, from Robert Nozick. So for people who think that happiness is the main intrinsic value. So some, some people think, uh, are tempted to think, in fact, that um, happiness is the one thing that is intrinsically value. So all of those chains of extrinsic value, I got a degree so I could get a job, so I could get a house, so I could get a family, so I could be happy. And that happiness is the end of all of those chains. So uh, Robert Nozick gives us this sort of science fiction-y scenario that we're, we're meant to imagine to ask ourselves, do I really think that happiness is the ultimate thing? And it's called the experience machine. This is the scenario. It's from his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. So he asks, you, he asks us the following question. Suppose there's a thing called the experience machine. Would you want to be hooked up to this thing? And the, what the experience machine does is generate a convincing simulation for you of the most pleasurable experiences you can imagine for the rest of your life. So rather than this often scary and challenging and disappointing world of ups and downs, uh, you go into the simulation where everything is pleasurable forever. So you, I don't know, whatever, whatever your version of ultimate pleasure is you drive a Ferrari made of cocaine I don't know whatever whatever your thing is um, uh, now the question is would you give up the life that you have now to live in the experience machine until you're at the end the natural end of your life and if your answer is no then that suggests that you don't think that at least pleasure is the ultimate intrinsic good. Uh, now, I'm, I'm kind of waffling between pleasure and happiness here. I think happiness is an ambiguous term. Um, so happiness can mean the kind of moment-to-moment -moment experience of, oh, this feels kind of nice and good. Uh, or it can mean something I would propose much deeper. So uh, Nozick is asking us to imagine... Pure pleasure, momentary pleasure. Uh, imagine just having a nice time forever until you die. And would you give up the actual life that you're living now to be plugged into the experience machine? Um, so people genuinely, di genuinely differ on this. Some people would say, yeah, heck yes, I would absolutely jump in the pleasure machine. Uh, you know, forget this, forget this world. I'm not, I'm not invested in all of this. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go enjoy my, enjoy my pleasurable simulation for the rest of my existence. Um, I tend to say no, actually, I don't think I would go into the pleasure machine or the, sorry, the experience machine. Um, because for me, there are things that have value over and above the momentary pleasure of whatever it is. Um, there are things that I value more in some sense than happiness in it in some sense value more than happiness and i know that sounds weird to say but uh i think it depends on what you mean by happiness so uh sorry uh so for example um i'm i'm hoping to have a kid one day and when you do surveys of new parents what you find is that they're so you've got two senses of happiness uh two senses of the word happy um one in which like did you have a good day today? Was the were the moments that composed this day full of pleasure? Um, and new parents inevitably say no. Uh, their happiness in the moment to moment sense plunges. Right? Because they're sleep deprived. They get this stressful experience of trying to take care of a new life. They're trying to they're trying to like figure out how the best to do it. They got all this new difficulty in their life. This really challenging experience to have a new kid. So that everybody who's I've ever talked to has said this but on the other hand their rating of their life satisfaction their overall life satisfaction goes up so uh, what new parents report on average at least is um, and this is I mean a substantial number of new mothers go through postpartum postpartum depression so this is by no means everybody but um, on average at least 
new parents report that they're more satisfied when they ask are you satisfied with your life overall that rating goes up when you have a kid but if you ask how was your day today they report worse days right their day their day was crummy but their life feels better so uh that is to say there's probably something that we can probably at least two things probably a million things that we can pull apart here when we're talking about happiness what does it mean to be happy it's probably not just did i have a pleasurable moment now and now and now and now right and that's what the that's what the experience machine thought experiment is supposed to pull apart for us right so what we're being offered in the experience machine is just a whole bunch of temporary pleasures that don't add up to anything because it's all just a simulation um and if you don't think that a whole bunch of aggregated pleasurable experiences add up to a genuinely or deeply happy life, then you think that there's more to the life than just having momentary pleasures. So it's just to, it's just to elicit like this, this isn't an argument to be clear. So he's not, he's not saying you should go one way or the other, but he's trying to elicit our intuitions about what matters to us really. Okay. So, So we've just talked about uh, significance versus value. We talked a little bit about value. We talked about intrinsic and extrinsic value. Uh, let's return to the significance side of this. Remember the value of a nickel is exactly five cents. The significance of the nickel might depend quite a lot on how many other nickels you've got, um, right? So uh, let's talk about our cosmic significance. So Kahane uh, makes this claim that it's an open question whether we are of cosmic significance or not. So, which is a weird, you might think that's a weird thing to say, but uh, he thinks it depends ultimately on whether there's life on other planets. So the argument goes something like this. Um, we've, okay, so what's significant is, just, yeah. So what's significant is living things he thinks he thinks that's a sort of given right so um if the universe if the whole rest of the universe is just full of dead rocks and plasma um there's nothing what what's you know significance is grounded in something that cares about the world something that values things something that's interested in things so significance is always significance for somebody right significant to somebody to a subject to some conscious being uh or maybe unconscious if you if you're asleep or whatever but like um its significance is grounded in life you can't have significance without a living thing he argues um so what that tells us is uh if we're the only planet in the whole universe with life the fact that the universe is vast beyond comprehension, the fact that the, we are this tiny infinitesimal speck amongst, a, amongst an all, practically infinite void doesn't really matter when we're thinking about whether we're significant or not. So if we're the only planet with life, or perhaps we're the only planet with intelligent life on it, we might be nonetheless the most significant part of the universe. Despite how small we are, we might be cosmically significant because we're the locus of significance in the cosmos right you can't have significance without having conscious experience and if you've got conscious experience you can have significance but if the rest of the universe is just devoid of perspectives or views then uh we're it right so we are in that scenario we are cosmically significant and if we go away if humanity fails to survive, a great deal of significance has gone out of the universe. Okay, so then compare that scenario to one where the universe, imagine a, a different universe, imagine our universe is full of life, and not just full of life, full of intelligent life. Maybe there's 10,000 civilizations in our galaxy, and however many galaxies in the universe so there's just there's just zillions and zillions of intelligent species in the universe if humanity goes away in that scenario it 
kind of doesn't matter as much um, in cosmic terms. So we're not the locus of cosmic significance on that picture. We're just a, a thing that's significant. Um, we're, we're still, we're not insignificant, but again, this is like um, whether you got, you know, the significance of a nickel. Recall, we're not talking about value here. So humanity could still be valuable in a universe full of intelligent life. But if we're one of a trillion intelligent species, that's like one nickel versus a trillion nickels, right? So that's the significance of that goes down substantially. Okay, so what he thinks is that it's actually an open question whether uh, we are cosmically significant because we don't know whether there's a bunch of life in the rest of the universe or not. Um, okay, so... So that was his, that was Kahani's argument. Um, a couple of questions for Kahani that that maybe are worth thinking about. Um, you know, there's a good chance we're not the only life in the universe. Uh, that's I I find it very plausible that we're not. So if we're not, then we're not cosmically significant. Uh, but even if we are, suppose we are the only life in the entire universe, then. I mean, there's still this issue of the fact, I mean, there's still an issue with this because we won't be around forever, presumably. Um, you know, the, the chances that we'll survive go down and down. The longer we live, the less probability of survival we've got. So uh, what do we do with that is the question. Okay. So I propose to call this second problem uh, Tolstoy's problem. Uh, just so you know, nobody else calls it that, but hey, let's let's us call it that. Uh, so Tolstoy wrote the following. Um, uh, just for some context, Tolstoy was a super famous writer. He was famous in his lifetime. He was pretty rich. He had a nice family, a very satisfying creative life. He had pretty much everything that you could want out of life. Um, but he also had a kind of deep worry, a kind of existential worry. And he said stuff like this. He says, sooner or later, there would come diseases and death. All my affairs would sooner or later be forgotten, and I myself would not exist. So why should I worry about all these things? So I think that that's something that we as a species face. Um, any individual won't be forgotten for a while. Um, but if you start thinking in millions of years or billions of years or maybe trillions of years the probability starts getting pretty high that nobody's going to remember any of this stuff. Um, which may come as, in some sense, a relief. Uh, so no matter how much you screw up in life, eventually nobody will remember. Um, I do find that comforting sometimes. Um, but also it's sort of dispiriting because no matter how well you do in life, eventually nobody will remember. So what do we say about this kind of thing? Again, this is something that in some sense gets imposed on us by the scientific worldview because if there's a God and a heaven, then uh, somebody will always remember, right? There's a divine perspective and you live forever and you get to recount to your annoyed relatives all the things you did while you're alive forever and ever and ever. Um, but if you don't believe in an immortal soul, and this was essentially Tolstoy's resolution to this. So Tolstoy is a religious guy. Uh, he believed in an internal soul that resolved this. Um, but that's not really available to me. So what should we say about that? Okay, so I think, again, I'm not, I'm not, gonna, end, I'm not gonna end this up by telling you what the meaning of life is. Um, but I think that we can reasonably put some constraints on the, the sort of things that could count as meaningful lives, uh, different meanings that you could assign to your life. So what we've gotten so far, let's just to review, um, it's debatable whether purposes exist in some objective sense. That was the discussion we had in the last lecture. Not clear. Um, I think there's some reasonable case to be made that there are uh, purpose that purposes are naturalistically acceptable, 
But that's a debate rather than a sort of solid fact that we can rely on. Um, it's also unclear whether we're unique in the universe or not. Uh, we just don't know. We don't know. Maybe there's other intelligent life in like Maybe we're the only intelligent life in this galaxy. And if that's true, the chances that we're going to meet some other species turn out to be pretty and turn out to be pretty low. Uh, assuming that the speed of light is a hard limit on how fast things can travel, uh, if there's life in other galaxies, we'll probably never know about it. Um, and furthermore, it seems unlikely that life or that anything that we do will last forever. Uh, that's that's the kind of picture that comes when you if you don't believe in an immortal soul if you don't believe in an afterlife um, then things are just kind of temporary and there's not much you can do about that there's nothing there's nothing that we can do to change the the sort of temporariness of anything that we do either good or bad so these can kind of act as constraints on what would count as a good answer to what is the meaning of life or maybe better what would a meaningful life look like um so maybe we can sum that up by saying you know what a, a picture of what we're looking for starts to emerge out of this uh what we what we want perhaps is a sense of meaning that is self-generated that is it comes from inside of us rather than being imposed from without that is going to be necessary if uh, if both evolution and God fail to assign us a meaning, uh, then we got to make one ourselves. And we would better hope that it's compatible with us being, compared to the universe, tiny and finite. That is, we have a limited amount of, we're limited in size and uh, duration. So... Uh, maybe we could maybe we could look for something where we have self-generated meaning that's compatible with our tininess and finitude okay so um so just to just to remind you of this i mean if if god created us for a reason then we have we have a reason for being so we recall this discussion from before um but if evolution is the whole story of our creation and the argument that i gave you before about evolution not giving us a purpose is right then we have to come up with our own purposes we have to assign ourselves a purpose because there's nowhere else for it to come from right um i think it's plausible that uh you know we are biologically multi-purpose so you could become specialized for being an excellent athlete or gymnast or uh, you could be specialized as an excellent musician or an excellent writer or an excellent, you know, of all of the, you know, when, you, when you're talking about purpose, you want excellence for something. And human beings uniquely, I'll make the case a bit later, we seem to be uniquely suited to being multi-purpose. And that's one of the reasons why we took over the, the planet, right? Like, um, there are lots of animals that are very, very tuned in to a very specific niche, right? They can only eat three kinds of plants. They can only live in a sort of narrow temperature range. Humans are incredibly adaptable, which tells us that biology hasn't given us, in some sense, a purpose. We have to pick amongst all of those different ways, all those different excellences that are available to us, one that suits us. Um, so, a picture that sort of fits this nicely is existentialism. Um, so existentialism comes out of the phenomenological tradition, uh, developed mostly in the 20th century, mid 20th century, something like that. Um, and the existentialists say, we make our own meaning. Um, we, we, so this, I mean, the basic idea of existentialism is that meaning is self-generated it's self-assigned uh, we fundamentally decide the significance of our own lives um, I would note that uh, this is compatible with religious belief so uh, Kierkegaard I said sorry I was said earlier that existentialism is mainly a product of the 20th century but uh, Kierkegaard was both religious and 
you, a lot of people would classify him as an existentialist. So uh, you can believe this even if you believe in a creator God. You just have to believe that God didn't tell us what kind of beings we ought to be, right? So we generate for ourselves a purpose, a meaning, a goal. Um, so the slogan for uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, one of the most famous existentialists, was uh, if, you, if you wanted to explain in three words what this, this idea is, he says, existence precedes essence. So your existence comes before you having an essence. Um, so we've talked already about Aristotle. So the question is, what kind of thing are you? Uh, and Aristotle says, the kind of thing that you really are, your most essential selfhood, is your rationality. I mean, you've got an animal nature and a vegeta vegetative nature as well, but the thing that's most unique about humans, and therefore the thing that's most important to cultivate, is your rationality. So the best kind of life is uh, the life of reflection. Uh, Aristotle says the best life is the life of a philosopher. Um, uh, Confucius says something different. He says our our basic nature is our social nature. So what we are really is a social being and therefore being excellent in your social relationships is the way to be who and what you were really meant to be. So being a good citizen or being a good parent or child or sibling or you know all of the other sort of social relationships you enter into. Um, so for both of them, we have a kind of essence. The existentialists say we don't have what you don't come with an essence built into you. So there's no, you don't have an essential nature. You create one by living in some sense. You create for yourself an essential nature or a purpose or a goal or all that stuff by living a life. Um, so, um, now, they don't think, uh, it's easy to misinterpret the existentialists, they don't think that we're born without any kind of context. Uh, so obviously you're born with a whole bunch of constraints on who and what you are. So you're born with, uh, you're born to some parents in some place. You're born with a body, with various features. Um, you are, Heidegger says, you are thrown into life in some direction with some velocity. Uh, some people are thrown harder than others in, into life. Some people are just thrown right against the wall. Um, <clears throat> so they're not, they're not denying that you've been, you've been sort of chucked into life in some place and time and direction. Um, what they, what they want to say, however, is that you are ultimately responsible for your decisions about how you react to the way that you were thrown into life. So life gave you a hand and you get to decide how you play it, to use a metaf poker metaphor, I guess. Um, so they're not, they're not denying that there are facts about us. They're not saying that you are ultimately like creating yourself out of a puff of smoke or something like that. What they are saying, however, is that um, we are self-determining in the sense of determining our response to the world, our, our response to uh, the existence that we've been thrown into. So they also say things like this. Uh, we're condemned to be free. Uh, and Sartre, Sartre is famous for sort of uh, emphasizing the how challenging this is, um, he talks about nausea, uh, the existential nausea is the sort of like being confronted with the fact that you have to choose, you have to decide what you're going to make your life about. You're going to have to, in some sense, determine your own essence. Uh, and they specifically re they, they they refuse to answer specifically what it is we should do with that. Like Sartre's Sartre's not going to tell you, he thinks you shouldn't tell you, how you should decide what your life is going to be about, because uh, that's your burden. Your burden is to be the one who has to figure out what it's all going to be about for yourself. 
uh, and think what he calls uh, the rejection of this freedom bad faith. Um, so it's it's a it's a uh, a bad a bad way to live. A bad response to your freedom is to pretend that you've got an essence that you can just sort of rely on. Uh, to pretend that you've been assigned some task here on Earth, when in fact that's your job. Your job is to generate for yourself some some project here, some essence for yourself to decide who and what you are. Um, now, uh, so that's that's uh, nicely compatible with everything that I've said before about science, right? So, uh, you know. It, it's nicely compatible with the scientific worldview that says um, we aren't assigned in essence by the universe. Um, but I, sorry, I, I'm I'm eternally frustrated by this answer because uh, it, we're we're right back. I, in some sense, we're right back where we started. Uh, so I don't think Sartre's wrong here. Uh, but we, it doesn't give you much guidance. And so my, my question is, when I, when I get to this point in the story, my question is, okay, so how should I, how should I, what should I do then? I mean, how should I, how should I determine what kind of thing I should be? Um, and Sartre says, I'm not, I can't and won't answer that for you. So, you know, we start from the question, what's the meaning of life? And Sartre says, well, you figure it out. And I just feel like I was already trying. I was already trying to figure it out. That's you're not helping. That's not a helpful answer because I was already trying to figure it out. Um, so I don't know. So maybe that's just the end of the story. Maybe if life is to have a meaning, you have to f generate one for yourself, and that there's just nothing else that can be done. Um, I'd like to suggest in the remainder of this that maybe that's not the only possibility. Um, maybe we can put some, so, so far I've been, I've been talking about constraints that we can put on this question. So, uh, I, I find it very doubtful that people can just pick any random thing and say, okay, that's my purpose. I'm going to write as many letter cues as I can. So I'm just going to fill notebook and after notebook after notebook with the letter Q. That's my purpose. And it's as good as any other. Um, I think to go back to where we started this, this sense of felt meaning that we sometimes get to experience doesn't just you can't just say, okay, I'm just gonna pick something random out of a hat. And that's my meaning. Um, there, are, there are kind of a somewhat limited set of options for what's going to what's going to generate that sense of meaning for us. And here we can maybe look to psychology to get some of the constraints on what's what are reasonable options. So Sartre Sartre leaves us in this position of saying I'm not going to tell you. And he's not even going to lay out a menu of options for us. Uh, but maybe we can look to psychology to get that menu of options. Uh, to get some to get some facts about what's going to help us experience, you know, okay, it's up to us to generate the generate a meaning for ourselves because uh, the universe isn't going to do it for us. But what's going to work? I mean, what are my workable options? And there's some nice research on this actually. So uh, Paul Thagard wrote this lovely book called "The Brain and the Meaning of Life," um, and he looks at a whole bunch of studies. So there's been, there's been actually, so there's this kind of really nice developing literature in psychology about the sense of meaning, the sense of happiness. So this is part of a broader project called Positive Psychology. For a really long time, psychology was focused on all the uh, difficult and painful things that your mind can do. Uh, pathological psychology was the kind of the important thing, and that's a crucially important thing for psychology to study, of course. But uh, we also want to know some things about when how things can go right. Uh, so this is this is a project in positive psychology, um, looking at the different ways in which our brain can uh, experience the world as meaningful. So um, 
So going back to the distinction that I talked a little bit about with the Nozick experience machine thought experiment, Thagard wants to distinguish between happiness and satisfaction. So this is, this is his way of carving things up. So happiness, let's call it, is the momentary feeling of joy, pleasure, you know, just a feeling good in that moment. Um, satisfaction is maybe more what we're looking for when we're looking for a sense of the meaningfulness of life. Um, he says a long-term appraisal of the worth of your life as a whole. Uh, if we're looking for the meaning of life, you know, what you're what you're after is satisfaction in that sense. Um, we want to be able to step back and ask, you know, was that all worthwhile? Was that overall a worthwhile thing to have done for however many, many years I lived? And uh, be able to come up with the answer, yes. So uh, Thagard argues, and this is based not on philosophy, but on psychology, um, looking at how people respond, how people with different types of lives report their level of satisfaction. And what he thinks is that you can broadly uh, chop the factors that contribute to a sense of life satisfaction into work, play, and love. Um, not super surprising, but... Uh, at least uh, the the evidence sort of backs up what you might have intuitively thought. So he says the following. I'll just I'll just read this quote from Thagard's book, which summarizes a whole bunch of psychological results. Uh, in sum, your life is meaningful to the extent that one, you have goals which are emotionally valued mental representations of situations consisting of patterns of neural activity. It's a very romantic guy, Paul Thagard. So that is to say, you've got a goal. And the goal is something that you care about. Okay. Uh, two, your life is meaningful to the extent that some of your goals have been accomplished to some degree. So, you know, your goal might be to save the world or to bring about world peace. Uh, <clears throat> probably you're not going to get all the way there. But if you can at least contribute to the goal, right? You can contribute in some meaningful way to the thing that you regard as valuable. Um... Three, you have other goals not yet accomplished that have reasonable prospects of accomplishing. So to have a sense of a meaningful life, you want to have both, you want to have goals that both you've made some progress on and that you could continue to make some progress on. Um, fourth, and this is an interesting one to me, your goals are coherent with each other. So you're not both trying to save the rainforest and to strip mine the rainforest, right? You want your goals to apparently, so according to the best research available, your goals should be at least consistent. Uh, they should, they should like hang together in some sense. Um, and five, your goals are objectively valuable. <coughs> Pardon me. So that one's tricky. Um, I'm going to admit I don't know what makes something objectively valuable um, but again we can put a couple of constraints on this uh, and they're constraints based on essentially where value comes from so what makes something valuable and just like with significance I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that value is always value to somebody Right, is valuable to someone, to somebody who's first of all alive, um, because you have to be alive to value anything, and second, probably conscious in some sense, because value is a conscious experience, so or at least capable of consciousness. So when we're thinking about which goals have objective value it's probably a reasonable constraint to put on that set of possibilities uh, that, for example, they let life continue, right? Uh, so if your goal, if you've got the supervillain goal of wiping out all life, that's probably not going to be objectively valuable because there's nobody there afterwards to value it. And value is grounded in life and consciousness. So your goals have to be consistent with the continuation of life and consciousness. Again, this is trying to just 
fill in some of the gaps that that Sartre leaves us with. So Sartre leaves us with this wide open field of possibilities. And I think you, I, my claim is that we can use some of this research to put constraints on it. So Sartre says, you know, you have to figure out what your life is like, what kind of thing you are. And if I said, well, Sartre, I'm a supervillain and my goal is to destroy humanity. I don't know what he'd say in response. Um, but Thaggard has something to say in response to that. Thaggard could say, look, when we look at the kind of goals that people find meaningful, they're ones of in some sense, objective value, value not just to the subject, but to maybe a bunch of subjects, so intersubjectively valuable, or at least potentially valuable by a subject. So uh, that life should continue seems like a requirement for anything to be valuable, right? It's a condition, the existence of life and consciousness are a condition for the possibility of things having value. Therefore, your goal should be consistent with the continuation of life and consciousness. So uh, don't let don't let intelligent life die out or something like that. Don't let life in general die out. Seems to be an important constraint on the goals that we can meaningfully set for ourselves. Um, and conscious beings particularly have this interesting property um, that we get to have goals that we construct ourselves. Um, that is, we are the kind of things that that don't come with goals built in, but rather build our own goals. Uh, and if your goals conflict with you being alive and conscious, they might not be good goals. So if your goal is to get as addicted to drugs as you can and never have another feeling you're under you're undermining the condition for the possibility of you constructing goals right so um you don't want to you don't want to when you're just trying to decide what your goal is it should be compatible with this fact about us that we are goal setters right so uh, even under the existentialist view uh, we are the kind of thing, a conscious being is the kind of thing that can set its own goals. We can at least put that very broad constraint on this thing. So uh, to remain the kind of thing that can set your own goals, at least while you're still alive, seems like a pretty important constraint on what kind of goals you should set for yourself. Um, and furthermore, it seems like people especially like setting goals for themselves. Uh, if you if it's a goal that you've developed for yourself, people are particularly attached to those goals um, because it's yours in some sense. Uh, it's unique to you, or it's at least something that you've you've got for yourself. So if if somebody imposes a goal on you and says, "Look, if you don't do this, you're in trouble," uh, we're less motivated by that, and there's sort of less intrinsic value to it than if you yourself decided that you were going to do it. So setting our own goals does seem like the kind of thing that uh, we should preserve in our goal setting. And you might even want, here's a recommendation, uh, to try to set goals that make you more capable of setting goals. Uh, so we, we, are the kind of things that make ourselves. Uh, and I think this is uh, pretty apparent from just our biology. So, I mean, we make ourselves in the sense, in a very banal sense, in the sense shared by all living things that, you know, you make your all your own parts. You take in food, you break it down, you construct it into your organs, right? So we've all made ourselves in that sense. But humans especially seem to be able to make ourselves much more flexibly and dynamically and uh, sensitively than other animals. And uh, this example of crows versus chickens is one I come back to over and over again. Uh, the, and it's one I, I, I've lifted from the cognitive scientist Alison Gopnik. So Alison Gopnik uh, gives this example of, you know, chickens, when they hatch, 
they, they kind of have their full behavioral re re repertoire in six weeks or something like that. Like, it doesn't take you that long to become a full-fledged chicken. They scratch things, they peck at things. That's kind of it, right? Like, there's not, not a whole lot to being a chicken, and they get it down pretty fast. Uh, whereas crows and ravens can sometimes be dependent on their parents to be to feed them for years, two years or something like that, right? So way, way longer period of self-construction, cognitive self-construction. So there's the bodily self-construction that's ongoing throughout our lives of like building and maintaining a body. But there's also this sort of mental self-construction where you figure out how to, first you figure out how to see objects and then you get object permanence. So you remember where objects are when you can't see them. You build a picture of the world. You categorize things. You learn how to categorize things. You learn how to think about things. You learn how to do abstract thinking. So layers and layers of cognitive self-making. And humans are, and so the difference between a cra raven and a chicken is the chicken is never going to solve a complicated problem that's never encountered before. Whereas a crow or a raven can do actually very sophisticated problem solving. So they can think through insight style problems, problems where they have to reframe the problem, where they have to do, you know, in, they have to have a little aha moment to, to restructure the way they've thought about it, to think about things in new ways. Um, and that's the most characteristic thing I think about humans is that we can do that more than any other animal. And our self-making in some sense is deeper than any other animal so you can restructure yourself uh, more profoundly than any other animal on the planet can restructure itself and i can tell you that uh from my experience anything that i've done which enhances that the depth of my own self-making has come through my experience as profoundly meaningful uh, and not just mine. So if I can if I can help somebody else, so generally speaking, enhance the depth of their own self-making, um, that I, I, just, I get a real hit of meaning off of that. Um, and I have things in mind here like what we're doing right now. So education is this really profound tool for enhancing your ability to set your own goals. The more you know about the world, the more you understand the world around you, the more critically you can look at the world, ask yourself questions. Does it have to be this way? Is this the only way it could be? Right. So um, the ability to, to uncover ideology, for example. So an ideology is a framework that you can't see. If you can make that framework visible for yourself, then you can critique it. You open up a new avenue of self-making you've enhanced the depth of your self-making so uh i would argue that i think i think i've made a decent argument so far that um you need to be able to set your own goals in order to experience a meaningful life and what i can't argue for other than just sort of my own life experiences that enhancing the depth of your own self-making is for me a very reliable way of so any any goal that i set for myself that lets me be more you know like i learned to read and that let me be more self-making because now i can go get my own knowledge uh, i learned to think i learned to do philosophy i learned to critically reason i learned to question the assumptions of things around me um i do a whole bunch of stuff to keep myself self-making. So I, I try to uh, reflect on my life. I try to think about habits I've fallen into that maybe I could get out of. I try to avoid things like uh, drug addiction that would undermine my ability to, to so like, want, you know, why, why would not I just sort of get addicted to drugs and have a bunch of pleasure? The answer is because it would undermine my ability, the depth of my own self-making, right? Once you're addicted to, like, say you're addicted to heroin, your goal is get more heroin. That's it. That's your goal. And you're kind of stuck with it unless you can get out from under it, right? So you can't decide to take up the violin until you get off heroin. So you're off, you're, when you're stuck in an addiction, the options you have for self-making get narrowed dramatically, right? You're just servicing your addiction. So 
uh, trying to maintain a life where you're not stuck in repetitive, uh, imposed goals, goals imposed by, say, being addicted to, I mean, heroin and or World of Warcraft, like whatever you get addicted to. Those addictions reduce the depth of your self-making because you're just operating according to a fixed set of goals. Whereas if you're free of addiction or relatively speaking free of addiction, you get to define more of your own goals. So I propose to you that that's one of the things that's most characteristic about humans is the depth of our own self-making. Um, and I would also propose to you as a pretty rich vein, I will say. I'm not, uh, by no means is this the meaning of life, but it's a rich vein of, to mine for looking for that hit of the sense of the meaningfulness of life, right? You're, we're, we're making up our own meaning. I mean, the, the basic outline here is we're making up our own meaning. We're making this up as we go along, right? Uh, it's human-sized meaning, and it's human-generated, uh, because nobody else generated it for us. Um, but this seems to me a good place to look. If you can, if you can, I recommend, perform agency in a way that enhances the performance of agency. So by agency, I mean um, being a goal setter rather than just a goal seeker. So constructing your own goals. Uh, and if you construct goals in a way that enhances, and I'll, let me emphasize, it's not just enhancing your own ability to set goals. Enhancing somebody else's ability to set goals gives me just the same you know, hit of meaning as enhancing my own. So helping somebody to learn something, helping somebody to grow, helping somebody to, to see more broadly or to develop or to, to expand their worldview or that kind of thing, that's just as rich a source of this sense of meaning for me as, as anything. So, and I think that coheres pretty nicely with uh, what Thagard says, uh, and it fulfills the kind of constraints that I've been trying to develop throughout this lecture on what a potential meaningful life could be. So it's the kind of thing that you can do as a tiny, finite agent that will eventually die and go away. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you don't need to have imposed from some outside source. Um, <clears throat> It's the kind of thing that you can have a kind of coherent picture about, uh, and it's the sort of thing that you can accomplish in little in little bites. So recall Thagard's requirement that um, we you have goals that you can accomplish some of and have some left to do. So performing agency in a way that enhances agency is something that you can do little bits of uh, and still have lots left to do, kind of thing. Okay. Right, so there you go. Um, that's 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 the best I've got on the meaning of life uh, and the interactions between uh, our sense of meaningfulness and the universe uh, and the uh, the best scientific picture we have of the universe. I think science puts a number of important constraints on how we can think about meaning, but it also gives us some guidance. Right, so you can look at the kind of positive psychology literature and what actually helps people have life satisfaction for some, a little more guidance than the existentialists give us about what are good options for thinking about how we should conduct ourselves. Okay, that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>